Hey, everybody. It's the Lucas and Charlie Super Screenplay Power Hour, or whatever we're calling it this week. I'm uh, Charlie Vignola, half of your host. My other half is Lucas Kendall right here, as you can see. Hi, Lucas. How are you? Good morning, Charlie. I, I botched the first uh, opening, so I said, Charlie, why don't you do it? And our Screenplay Power Hour, I called it that because it's neither an hour nor full of power. <laughs> but we do our best, and sometimes we it's do our over best. an hour. So. Uh, um, yeah, I, I wanted to start today just to acknowledge current events, which I, I could, I could barely function after the Texas news. I mean, I same, just, same here. I was yeah. in a in a in a just a well of despair watching that all day long and getting too busy on Facebook, knowing that that's like just firing blanks. No bad pun intended in terms of getting things to change. My wife and I. Uh, who's visiting her mother up north. Uh, we spent a lot of time going back and forth on updates. And uh, it's just, I, what, the, what, the thing I hate the most about it, Lucas, is they, there's a term in psychology called learned helplessness, which is the more uh, tragedy somebody seems to uh, deal with, the more you get a sense of like, I can't do anything about it. You just sit in a corner and you just like hold your head down and you just accept you know, yeah. this demented slaughterhouse of a world is, you know, yeah. uh, you know. It's also, but it's, the, but it, it's also the film business, but. It, 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 it is, but the thing is, um, we can change things. You just have to go out and vote. It's the simplest yeah. thing. And I know that one party is trying to make it harder to vote with a lot of different laws, but still you can go out and you can vote. You can write your congressman, all these things that are cliches. They do work. They do change things. I mean, it's incremental. You just have to go out and do it. The other thing I was talking to somebody about was, you know, we can't do anything about guns. It's like, Guns are a consumer product. They don't grow from trees. They don't come up out of the ground. They're a consumer product. Of course, they can be regulated. Of course, we have yeah. rules about who can have them and how. It's just you need the political will to do it. And obviously, there's a huge part of you know Congress and legislators who either don't believe in doing anything about it and want to loosen gun laws, uh, or they... Um, don't have the numbers to to change things, but that only again. That so, only happens yeah, that. it's a structural <clears throat> and a and a cultural problem. And I, I wrote a few words about it in my blog. I'll put the link in the in the in down there. But I don't want to, us to take up too much of our time. But I I just uh, yeah I couldn't watch the news. I mean, my kids right now are at school and they're that age and. Well, I mean, I will, I will say this also. We had a, a, a school shooting, and uh, I live in Santa Clarita, California, and we had a school shooting a few years ago in I Saugus remember that. I remember that. High School, and it was like, it was after my kids were out of public school, thankfully, but uh, another friend of mine who's a screenwriter, uh, there was a shooting at his son's school. Nobody was killed. But that's why it didn't make the news. But he was just commenting on that the other day. It's just yeah, like, it's, it, it, it makes the news uh, to a dozen bodies. But if it's just a shooting, it's just an everyday person walking onto a school with a gun, then that doesn't make the news anymore. I'll, I'll but, tell you um, a story, Charles. <clears throat> this was told to me by a friend of Martha's Vineyard who ended yeah. up being the, the chief of police in one of the towns, a really decent guy, nice guy. He said, and he went to our high school, the Martin's Vineyard High School in the early 70s, and he told, he remembered a story where he and his friends would go hunting after school. So it's a hunting community, they'd hunt deer, and they had their shotguns, and they're like pickup trucks. Principal came up to him, and he said, you know, I saw, um, I was walking past your truck, and I saw that you had, a, you know, your, your rifle in the, in the back. And uh, I, you know, it just doesn't seem like a, a really safe thing so i'll tell you what why don't you come and why don't you bring it inside and keep it in your locker and he was like oh of course no but this is real this is like 1973 but that's what the world was and that was it's unthinkable absolutely unthinkable but that was a totally normal like responsible thing to do because they were responsible well, and that's also yeah, why i understand the gun owning culture because i know people come from that culture where they have their hunters and that's there are too many deer in Martha's Vineyard, but it's a long story. I, I, I think it's just, it's depressing when you hear like legislators, grown adults in the aftermath of this basically saying, well, if all the teachers were armed, it's like, no, I know. Um, I, yeah. I, I, they were armed and this, and it, it's a, I, I can't get into the details. It's too, it's too depressing. Painful. But anyway, it's, it's off our charter, but you, you were at something fun 
for a change last night? Yeah. Uh, so last night I went to the cast and crew screening of Top Gun Maverick at the Chinese theater in Hollywood. And um, I'm happy to report and yeah, I worked on the movie. So take this with a grain of salt. It's a sensationally entertaining movie. Uh, it really, really came together. Um, I know that there's always a lot of cynicism about sequels being cash grabs and hey that's because most of them are um in this case um it took a long time to put the sequel together i'd say that you know we were working on it on and off for like i don't know 15 17 years in various iterations until it um finally came together um and because of covid it got delayed two full years uh it was supposed to originally come out during uh the summer of 2020 and it's now coming out for Memorial Day weekend 2022. Um, normally, movies are up against the wall in terms of a release date. You're like racing to get this movie finished. So a lot of movies are just like, maybe they're not complete, but they are where they are when they have to be finished for release. In this case, you had the incredible luxury because of this external circumstance uh, for them to continue tinkering with it, working with it, rewriting, reshooting, re-editing, you know, test screening in ways that... that um, frankly never really happened in the business and um and in a lot of cases tinkering with a movie too much can be a deficit a problem and there's plenty of examples of that in this case um it made a good movie better and better and better and better and uh tom actually has a lot of say so uh about how the movie gets developed obviously um he's not just a, the actor but he's like a creative force and the making of the movie so you know he, he gets a lot of say so and um it it works it just works it's just it's just a big fun summer blockbuster it's 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 got a lot of heart it's got a lot of smart callbacks to the first movie it is relevant in terms of the times it is um uh just very entertaining just super entertaining and i think uh people are gonna go crazy for it. I mean, if you'd like the first movie and there's a big fan base for the first Top Gun, I think this is a worthy sequel that people will get a huge kick out of it. I took my uh, 25 year old son and my 21 year old daughter. My son loves the original Top Gun, even though he didn't grow up in the eighties, it's kind of a cultural touchstone for him. I don't know if my daughter ever saw the original Top Gun, but they both just had a blast. The, and the audience really, really enjoyed it. So well, I hope the homoerotic content has been maintained. There is, there is a, there is a parallel scene to the famous uh, oh, volleyball scene in this movie. I mean, there are a few key motifs that they tried to come no, up I, with. I, I, I'm, I'm glad before. this is an extremely mainstream popular gay movie. Is getting yeah, no, no. I mean, it, and, uh, and, and Tom, <laughs> Tom is great. You know, I mean, Tom is, uh, he looks good and there, there's, there's uh, Ed Harris is in it and John Hamm. Anyway, oh, I, I hear it's great. I mean, everybody it's really, it's that. really, I'm yeah. not saying that just because I worked on the movie, I believe me, I'd be honest with you. In this case, uh, yeah, I had seen, you know, bits and pieces of it, but never, never the whole thing all at once until last night. And I was very pleasantly surprised the critics are right on this one. It's, it's a fantastic entertainment. So yeah. and what was it like with them um, doing iterations of this script over 15 years? I, it's just very interesting to see sort of the ins and outs and all the different ways that they're trying to figure out what should a Top Gun 2 be look like? What should be the issues and the themes you're dealing with? Like, do we deal with, you know, the character in the death of Goose or do we do something entirely different? And uh, thank, thank God I'm not going to ruin it for you. But like I said, there are a lot of callbacks to the original movie well, in this case creates the beating heart of the movie. Uh, so as, as you were working on this for 15 something years, yeah. did you get to the point where there was the version of the movie for a 40 year old Maverick that now you just realize it has to be a, a 55 year old Maverick or do you, is that not addressed? I mean, do well, there, you have there, to totally change the movie just because his, history has moved on? And uh, every, every single version of it had to deal with the fact that obviously Tom Cruise is a lot older than he was in 1986, you mm -hmm. know, when the movie originally came out. So that means that you, you do have to deal with that, right? You have to deal with senescence. You do have to deal with aging. You have to deal with why is he still flying planes, you know, 35 years later uh, when he's, you know, he should be somewhere else in the chain of command. And those, those things are part of the story and those are, those and are dealt with. How, what was the process like at Brockheimer? Would there be like story meetings with you and five other people just to talk about what do we want this movie to be? You're bringing in the, can you, uh, over, I'm interested. Over, over. 
yeah, over over time, it, it was just there were a series of different writers that came in to pitch their take on it. And uh, until we really had a version of the story that started to coalesce, plus you have to get obviously Tom's buy-in and Tom has to be available to make the movie. So I think I've mentioned this in previous shows, like sometimes you hear actors talk about like, well, you know, uh, I, I had to wait for the right script to come along and, and, and that's when I jumped in. That's not always true. <laughs> like a lot of the time the actor jumps in and the, the actor is good and ready to make that particular movie. And then when the actor is ready, then they throw all the resources in the world, all the rewriters and script doctors and everybody in because it's like, well, we're going to make this movie now. So we basically throw all the effort into it. But until and unless that happens, until the actor is really truly ready to commit to the script uh, or to the project, then we're kind of a little bit in the wilderness, especially if you're making a, a, a movie that's that's based on or a sequel to a huge hit film. It's not like, you know, every single time that we developed a version of Beverly Hills Cop or, or you know, or, or National Treasure, you know, we weren't uh, soliciting the the intimate uh, kind of advice or, or um, input of the big star, but there is a certain point in the process where, okay, we got it good enough now, the studio might respond to it now. And if the studio does, then we call the big star and say, hey, the studio is ready to make the movie. Are you, do you have time? That kind of thing. Uh, and in this case, it was a combination of, you know, the script kind of like finally coming closer to a version that we knew uh, Paramount would respond to. And, uh, and Tom was ready. You know, there's a certain point where Tom was ready to make the movie and Tom, once he got on board, then he came in with all of his ideas and he has, of course, his writers that he likes to work with. And then it starts kind of taking on a life of its own. And again, it doesn't, it doesn't end at shooting the movie. Yes, you shoot the movie and then, oh, you know, that doesn't work. We have to re reshoot that subplot or, you know, that scene doesn't work. We have to reshoot that. And it's like, and if you're Tom, uh, you have that kind of influence and power at a studio, then you'll, you'll get those things to make the movie better. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes you're just stuck with what you shot and that's what you have. And so you just do the best you can. But in this case, again, the, the blessing in a weird way was the fact that the movie uh, just kept getting pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed, which means that they had more and more and more time to tinker with it until they literally got to a point where, where you never do, which is, oh, we're actually happy with it now and we can like, we're done with it and we can wait for the release. Whereas usually you're just racing until the last minute. Well, right, because I've been told <laughs> that they usually... They need. They've got so much money in the bank loans tied up in the movie they yeah. need to recover, and they need to. That that has hurt a lot of, of the music scores because they compress the post production to the point where the composers don't have any time, and they keep changing. Right. Because I come from from film music, with a magazine yeah. I used to do. Um, and and release see, dates are generally hard. Release dates are generally hard. If you say the new Star Wars movie is coming out for Christmas, it better be. Well, out yeah, for they, they because then yes, the theater they've got obligations to the theater owners. But not just that, you and also have all the merchandising uh, yeah. tie-ins and everything. Yeah. It's just like there's a huge mishigas of things that have to be, you know, aligned for a movie. And did you see that Deadline article about 45 writers on a... All right, can you hear the lawnmower outside? No, I cannot. Okay. I good. think we're good. Okay. Right. Um, now I hear it. <laughs> now I don't. Did you see the Deadline article about 45 writers on a, on a high-profile comic book movie, which I think is The Flash? No. <laughs> 45 writers they said yeah it's it's um Aye. it was an article about how screenwriters are trying to um trying to figure out like how to make money in this era where everything's packaged and writers are just blown through because you, you don't get the royalties if you don't get the credit and there's right. no way 45 writers are going to get credit how many i well, mean how, what's your record at, for I, I, no. Uh, at credits, I, well, it, I, I always find it interesting because, um, you know, since I've worked on every Brookheimer movie for 31 years, and I see the writing process, mm -hmm. you know, there, there's a thing called arbitration, which yeah. is at the end of the day, after, you know, the movie is finished, all the writers who participated in any aspect of the writing get their day in court with the Writers Guild, and they write these long letters uh, that are designed to help convince the Writers Guild that they should get screenplay credit because it is super valuable for your career, for money, for all sorts of reasons why you get credit on that movie at the end of the day. And so um, I've been frequently surprised at the end of the day to see what the arbitration 
bears out because a lot of times on our movies and I know on a lot of other people's movies, the person who got credit on the movie isn't the person who wrote that movie. Like you will, you, and, and, and if you don't you do your due diligence as a, as a filmmaker, as a producer to find out who really wrote that movie and you're just going purely on credits without doing a little background check, you could get screwed because there were times when we hired writers on big projects and it was sort of like, oh, he got a credit on, for the sake of argument, Toy Story. He's one of the writers of Toy Story. And you're just like, oh, well, let's, yeah, Toy Story is brilliant. Let's get him for our movie. And then you hire them and you're just like, oh, they didn't write the version of Toy Story. <laughs> they wrote the very, very, very first version of Toy Story like 18 years ago that right. had nothing to do with that movie, but they arbitrated as being the first writer and they got credit on the movie. That happens more than you think. So um, it's a little misleading sometimes with writer's credits as to who actually wrote the movie that you saw. And so, um, yeah, I mean, if uh, we, we learned that lesson a lot, like you have to do your due diligence, find out who really wrote that movie. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I, yeah, I look forward to seeing it. And um, you said you also had a, an experience oh, yeah. with a horror project that would be interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, so um, yeah, during the last week, um, I have a friend who is a producer and, um, you know, I, I have a couple of projects that we talk about uh, together and, you know, we're always looking for things to work on together. And so we got a screenplay, a horror screenplay submitted to him, just like, hey, what do you think? If you like it, maybe we can work on it together. And it was just kind of educational to sort of uh, look at and analyze because, you know, it has a lot of the common issues that we've talked about in previous shows. In this case, I won't get into specific details because it's a script that's still in the marketplace. I'll, I'll just speak in very broad terms, but, but it's, it's a movie in the vein of something like, I know what you did last summer, this kind of movie where there are a bunch of teenagers, there's like some sort of malevolent force that's taking them out one by one. And um, we know from the beginning that it's not uh, uh, just a person, that it's some sort of supernatural force. Uh, so the whole movie plays is kind of a mystery. One of the lead characters who realizes, you know, she's in this jam and her friends are being targeted. Why are they being targeted? What's really going on? What's responsible for it? You know, how do we stop it? Those are all sort of the questions. You know, it's like a math equation. You got to figure that out. Um, but one of the problems with the piece was that the rules of how the supernatural entity worked were very convoluted and unclear. So you couldn't really get a sort of a sense of what could or couldn't happen or why it was happening. Um, the, 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 the way that people were being killed off was a combination of arbitrary in terms of the order in which they were being killed, but also the methodology of how they were being killed started to get a little bit repetitive. Um, you know, cause variety and deaths is very important when it comes to like a, you know, a movie where people are being killed off and, uh, ultimately <clears throat> the origin, you know, cause these, a lot of these things are mysteries about like, well, what happened, you know, in poltergeist it's sort of like why is this happening why is this happening in this location to these people at this time and they have a very simple elegant solution they built a real estate development on a, a grave site and the, and the ghosts are angry because all their gravestones got moved that's simple this was not that simple in terms of like what the background the backstory ultimately when the character main character finally figures out what's really going on it's kind of like huh who what like it was so overly complicated and didn't quite make any logical sense. And then the very end was um, kind of a confrontation between our main character who was menaced, uh, the supernatural force that was that killed everybody and was about to kill her, and a, a human antagonist who was sort of responsible for setting the whole thing in motion, like launching the first domino essentially. And so our, our hero, our heroine was basically stuck in a situation where she was trying to reason logically with the supernatural force like literally talking out loud about don't be mad at me be mad at the person over here who is the person who is responsible for kind of causing the curse to happen and it starts getting sort of silly but um anyway it was just again it was an interesting exercise in you, you, those are a kind of movie right and it all does come down to execution because it's like 
there's a million movies about a bunch of teenagers who wind up getting killed one-on-one by, uh, by a slasher or by a supernatural force. But there are brilliant, simple, you know, clever versions of that. And then there are just dreary, bad, generic versions. And then there's something like this, which is like overly convoluted and complicated and, and doesn't really work for a variety of reasons. Plus, there was a gimmick like a high concept gimmick of like why uh, why all these people were targeted, which 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 constituted the the sort of the name of the project. And again, I'm hedging around it because I don't want to ruin it. But um, let's just say the the gimmick that was the selling point of the of how these people were targeted is ultimately completely arbitrary. Has nothing to do with the curse that you find out about in the course of the story. They're not connected. So you're just like, huh? Okay, well that was a complete bait and switch because those things are disconnected from one another and don't really make a whole lot of sense. So, uh, you know, I guess if you're going to do a thriller, uh, you want to have twists and turns for sure. You want to have uh, suspense and, and building escalation, you know, of, of stakes. And, uh, you know, a lot of these things are built around a mystery. But, you know, just try to make the mystery retroactively clear so that it doesn't feel like it's so clumped together and convoluted and if you're going to do a supernatural movie just make sure that you know if you do have any kind of like rules as to what the thing can do or not do try to make them semi-consistent don't make them all over the place so that the audience just doesn't have any idea of what can or or cannot happen um uh it, it, clarity is clarity is very important and the more questions i'm asking when i'm reading something and they accumulate over the read the more I'm just like, forget it, you know, like, you're I mean, like there a, are a couple of things. And you're a clarity yeah. Nazi. I, I, I am because it's sort of like, that's where you, that when people read something and they don't respond to something, and especially if they're a civilian reading something, a lot of times it does come down to clarity. Like I didn't follow why that happened, who did that, for what reason, why are we here? Like all those kind of things. And I, it's a common problem in screenwriting. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've done it, I've done it a million times. And you don't really know until you get um, somebody who's not you to read the screenplay and say, I don't get this. Why did this happen? And sometimes you have to ask questions because they might not immediately, they just know it's not working for them for some reason. But you have to sort of ask those questions like a guy at a test screening. Well, what what bumped you? At what point in the story did you kind of like get lost? Or And then focus on those things because it might be clear in your head. A lot of times it's clear in your head. It's just not on the page and rewrites are about getting to the point where it's like, okay, so now it's clear. Now it's clear on the page why this person is motivated to do this or that or the other thing, or you know how these two events are connected. You know, it's like, well, you left out the connected tissue. You gotta, yeah, you you, you fool that. yourself by your own familiarity. It reminds me of a story that's not quite the same, but I read it in some some project, some book about John Frankenheimer. Yeah, I think they were making the challenge, the uh, you mm. know the, the ninja movie with Scott Glenn in the early eighties. Yeah. And they had an Asian, a Japanese actor who was speaking his own dialogue and he had an accent. And they became concerned about the clarity of his uh, speech. And so they all knew what every word he was saying, but they're like, hmm. So they brought in like the security guard and said, we do me a favor, you know, Vern, we just watched the scene and just tell me what you think. And the guy sat and he watched the scene. And the guy was like, well, that's a very good scene, Mr. Frankenheimer, yeah. And the guy said, well, I just have one question. What language was that guy speaking? <laughs> <laughs> so it's, you really, you just, yeah, you have to get the outside eyes. And, and it's easy to diagnose the problems that it's unclear. It's, it can be very hard to fix it because yeah. usually fixing it means you just need to drop some part of the premise. And usually people don't want to do that because every all if they've got like a four-part premise every single part of it is near and dear to their heart and they sure. don't just want to you know just a, but you just got to do it you just have to pick one i had that experience i was a friend of mine with the script and i was trying to explain that you know you've got four main characters and that would work in a tv show but as a feature you gotta pick one and well i need the other one because and it's like no but the reason you need it is for the plot that you've established you make a different plot you know right. that, and it's really you see you know the main character is very dimensional and the secondary characters are less dimensional and then the background characters are just you know their archetypes or characters or just a line or just color you know there's that 
that structure of it, but you have to, these things, features work best when it's narrow and deep. Yeah. No, if, I you're, agree. if your movie is shallow and wide, you're going to be uh, in trouble because it's, it's throwing the audiences constantly thinking, oh, now I know what this is. And then realizing that they don't. Why don't you speak for a while? Because I've got a lawnmower going past. I'm going to mute. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, obviously there there are ensemble movies, right? There there are movies that have like a group of characters, and you're following them all. I mean, like Love Actually, right? There's no main character to a movie like Love Actually. You're intercutting, I don't know, ten different mini stories, and that's become its own genre, right? Aren't there like a bunch of movies like that, like New Year's Eve and Mother's Day and Valentine's Day and you know, that's kind of like its own mini kind of romantic comedy um, uh, genre. And, you know, if it's done well, it's fun. But it's like you have to be a pretty, um, a pretty great writer to, to, to pull that off. I mean, I know that people are polarized on Love Actually. I, I happen to love it. I don't know what you think of it, but I, I really enjoy Love Actually. I can't um, even remember if I saw that one. I, I remember yeah, saying it, one, of, one, of the, the, one of that ilk. But I don't remember which one it was. Which one was the Mike Nichols movie with four? Yeah, characters? Richard Richard Curtis. Oh, no, so the movie I, the, the movie I was thinking of is called Closer, and it's got Julia Roberts, Jude Law, Natalie Portman, and Clive Owen. About two couples, and it's like twenty years ago. But anyway, okay. so there, yes, there are movies that are these ensemble pieces about. Well, every every Robert Alden movie is basically this, right? Yeah, uh, but I'm talking about if you're doing genre, if you're doing horror, the premise oh, yeah. of the horror, it's the audience needs to understand what they're watching. So if the movie is Rosemary's Baby, right, and then you meet a, you meet the character named Rosemary, so you right. know where this is going. And then there's that apartment that they probably shouldn't buy, and then yeah. there's those neighbors who won't leave them alone. It's and she's like, oh, nice to meet your neighbors, you know, but. It's just you want the audience to go, no, don't listen to this neighbor. And right. in Gremlins, it's obvious, okay, I got this magic pet. Oh, but there are these three little rules. So we know as an audience immediately, okay, this kid is going to break all three rules and, and you know, unleash hell on this small town from the Gremlins because it's called Gremlins. Right. So the audience is not waiting then for the devil to show up and the aliens to land and, and, and all kinds of weird other stuff and in but fact the, they make a joke on that they make a joke in gremlins when the girlfriend starts to tell the story about christmas and they go uh, no, no, honey not now yeah I, I remember that i mean there are look there are obviously there are exceptions to the rule have you ever seen cube is no, a thriller I, called cube i know what it is yeah it's a very it's a very i mean it's a brilliantly simple movie it's just sort of like a one room mystery but the mm -hmm. room keeps changing and it is an ensemble thriller like an ensemble horror thriller it's like a bunch of people wake up in this big cube shaped room and there are sort of they've tried to, got to try to escape and every time they leave through one of the portals in the cube they're going to another cube which is really just the same cube dressed up that's the way they made the low budget movie but there are death traps in every single mm -hmm. cube and they have to figure out how to get around them in order to sort of escape from whatever diabolical mind put them in the cube and there really isn't like a main character. It's sort of like all these characters sort of stuck together, but, but that's one, and, and it's, it's a rarity. It's, it's, that's not, you know, it, mo or Escape Room, the movie Escape Room is the same thing. I think there is kind of like one character who's sort of the main character, even when it comes to a movie like Boogie Nights, right? Which is a drama and it's an ensemble drama. And there are a lot of characters. You'd say that the lead character is still Marky Mark, right? It's- uh, uh, Yeah, of course. Mark Wahlberg is the lead, but yeah. you have like a dozen other characters who are all very well uh, differentiated and uh, and 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 you know fleshed out, who are very interesting. But you've got to be a really good writer to like write something like that. I mean, it's it's very tricky to be bouncing around all those different. It's hard enough to come up with one good story, but those kind of ensemble movies require you to come up with three or four or five different stories that you're kind of all interweaving through the course of the story right yeah i've never tried i've never tried to write one of those i don't i don't know about you uh i don't no, versions of it versions of yeah it. it's it you need yeah i did with this martha's vineyard project i've written oh okay so, so to, would... to, in a sense and it's but there it's contained and 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 um if you do that there's got to be a theme that right. brings it that that holds it all together the way American graffiti has the theme or the the setting and the, the period of in time and the period of life that the characters were at. And, that's a good that's a good yeah. example. American graffiti is another one. Like I don't yeah. I don't know who the lead of that would be. 
I mean, no, that is too. The, I mean, it's 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 Dreyfus? what lead is really Dreyfus, and the second, yeah, it's really I about guess. his journey from deciding that he's going to stay in the hometown to deciding he's going to leave, and then Ron Howard doing the opposite. Right, right. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's that's a very specific. I mean, uh, I guess that really kind of that kind of genre came of age in the '70s. I don't know that there were a lot of ensemble movies in the in the '60s, but that's an interesting structure. I, again, I haven't had an, uh, I have one idea, I guess that would fall into that category, but even that, even that idea has, um, a, a main character of sorts. Yeah. Um, there's always gotta be an anchor point or there's, it's always gotta be, you always want the outsider character that you can use to explain the world. And yeah. I mean, yeah. All, it's just, but it's about clarity. It's about foreshadowing and it's about, uh, making sure the audience understands what they're going to watch and and because rosemary doesn't realize that the that they're trying to <laughs> impregnate her with the devil's baby why yeah. would she who who would really suspect that you know yeah no um and but, but the thing is that it, like you, you and me both have written these sort of thrillers that have a mystery at the center right mm -hmm. um you know and that is figuring out how that mystery works and building that mystery and like, you know, making sure that a person is able to sort of follow clues along with the, the audience. I mean, that's, that's key to making. Yeah. And one of the hardest things, and it happened to me is that you start with like, Oh, that's, that's the anchor. That's the going to like, I know the three scenes that, that have to be there. And then the more you write it, you realize that that original anchor and those three scenes are the ones you got to cut because it's, <laughs> it's just evolved into right. something else and they don't work anymore and you tr you, and the, the sooner you just get rid of them the better uh like the the martha's vineyard your your passion project mm -hmm. was that born of a specific character a theme uh a, a story uh point that you wanted to build out like do you remember what the origin of that particular uh project well, that was? particular project is um, it's emotionally autobiographical i explained it's not actually okay. autobiographical but it's there's a version of a younger me and then there's a there's a a very problematic mentor character because in my life i've had some <laughs> problematic men mentors. mentor relationships and uh and there's been several completely different versions of it, but it started with, um, actually I use the American graffiti structure where you have these two characters where you have one character who's de determined to stay and the other character who there's no easy he's gonna be leaving. And then by the end of the movie, they switch so that each one has an arc. And right. it, kind of, it kind of revolves around that. And then it's making, building it from there. So yeah, I had certain, but it, but it, but it, but it began with your own experiences and saying like, I think there's enough here for a movie and how can I build this out from this? It began with a business proposition of, I wanted to make a movie super cheap. And if I did it in my hometown, I knew where to, and my hometown was a pretty unique place. I knew how to get lots of really good production value. And now I'm trying to find out if that's realistic or not. So that's interesting. So really the origin of it was, I want to make a movie so much that I'm going to do, I'm going to construct a scenario that I think could make a reasonably priced film, and then you build out from that. Yeah, which art, is how some people make art movies, thrives right? on limitations. It does. You yeah, know, I was telling myself, okay, no chase, no stunts, no dogs, no kids. You know, none of these things that are super expensive. Interesting. Just Interesting. find a way to have it be people talking and and go all over the vineyard because I know I can shoot two people talking, but if we're looking at this incredible beach behind them, it's going to look way more expensive than uh, the typical movie of that budget yeah no i mean it's it's that, that it comes back to just sort of like what motivates us how do you how do you decide on the idea that's going to be worth spending four to six months writing right because the thing is there are so many ideas that kind of bounce around in your brain i'm sure like me and mm -hmm. it's like I, I can only pick one that i'm really going to pour myself into for the next like you know half a year and 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 make that work so like how do i know i'm picking the right horse you know how do i know yeah. i'm betting on the right horse because the thing is that idea as we've discussed over and over again is the currency that is the most important thing when it comes to initially grabbing somebody's attention so you have to hope that you pick the right idea for people to go huh i want to read that that sounds cool and if well, you don't have that idea you are yeah. you just spend six months writing something and they're like, well, I, ah. I've spent the last four years because I've been locked into an idea because I made a very expensive sci-fi short film that then got a lot of views 
And so it's been, I've been spending four years trying to get a 15 minute story to work as a 100 minute story. And I think I finally have it, but it's been pretty rough. I think we need to end it here today. Okay. I've got some time limitations. So audience, we're gonna make this one half a show. And All right. Charlie and I are actually gonna come right back in a minute and record something else, an announcement by me, which we'll probably uh, put on a separate day. So thanks Exciting. so much. Thank you, Charlie. All right, take care. All right, bye. All right.